Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Judge. Mr. Ambrose. Yes, Your Honor. Is this your client at the Greenwood County Jail? Yes, that's Miss Green. All right. How do you pronounce your first name? Harris. 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 Okay. We are on the record in your case in 22 CR 136. The state appears by and through Ms. Gillette. I believe we're scheduled for an arraignment. Um, there was a violation of pre-trial supervision, failure to appear. This case has gotten kind of old. It is under the amended complaint, one count of unlawful possession of a controlled substance and count two is a misdemeanor and count three is another felony drug. What's the felony drug in count three fentanyl? All That's right. Fentanyl. Does your client need a formal reading? Actually, Judge, we're prepared to enter a plea today to count one, dismiss the balance of the complaint. She doesn't need a reading though, however. Show a waiver of reading, arraignment, counts two and three dismissed, and a guilty plea to count one. I'm sorry, let me. And no contest plea, Your Honor, to count one. Okay. All right. All right, Ms. Green, when you plead no contest, essentially what you're telling the court is, I'm not going to tell you, Judge, what I did wrong to support the charge, but I'm also not going to go to trial and contest the evidence. So that means that the court listens to the proffer of the state. Had we gone to trial, would they believe they could have proven? And if I find that one reasonable fact finder could have found you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, I'm going to find you guilty based on your no contest plea. In other words, I'm not independently um, evaluating your case for its strength or determination that 12 jurors would find you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm simply making sure that there's sufficient evidence to support your plea, finding you guilty based on your desire to plead no contest. Once I adjudicate you guilty on a no contest plea, you're treated the same as anyone who originally pled guilty or was found guilty by a judge or jury. In other words, there's no distinction uh, as it relates to sentencing, uh, post-sentencing matters, um, or anything of that nature, a probation violation or anything. Once you're found guilty, you're treated as an individual who's found guilty of a felony. Do you have any questions about that? No, Your Honor. Oh, okay. Now, you on the drug grid, this would be a felony conviction. So, Essentially, someone who's subject to a felony sentence is subject to the possibility or potential of serving prison as opposed to county jail time. You're only in the county jail awaiting trial on felonies. You can do up to 60 days in the county jail as a condition of being granted probation, and you can do some sanctions, uh, probation violation sanctions in the county jail. But other than that, um, the underlying sentence would be served in prison if you were uh, originally placed in prison or placed on probation and failed at your probation. The sentencing range is 10 to 42 months with the Department of Corrections, depending on your criminal history. As long as you don't have two or more person felonies as an adult or a juvenile in state or out of state, 
or six plus person misdemeanors, such as assault, battery, stalking, violating a protection order, any kind of misdemeanor that has to do with crime against a person, then you uh, would be presumptive probation or in a border box. If you're in a border box, if you evaluate for Senate bill treatment, you have a high risk assessment, you have a substance abuse evaluation that indicates a high need for treatment, then you're guaranteed probation. Even if there's some kind of special rule that might apply to you, such as being on bond or probation or parole at the time of the offense, the court's hands are pretty well forced to give you an opportunity for Senate bill treatment and probation. A condition though of that probation is you have to complete every component of the yeah. Senate bill treatment requirements, okay? I can also fine you up to $100,000. Um, normally, unless I think the crime's financially motivated, I don't assess a fine. I certainly don't assess one at that level. However, there are always cost fees, supervision fees. If you've never been convicted of a felony before, there's a DNA fee. Uh, there is a KBI fee for testing of the drugs or narcotics. There is a Senate bill fee of $300 that you have to contribute towards your evaluation and your treatment. Uh, at the end of the day, even with court costs, that can easily run twelve dollars to $1,500. However, you are allowed to make payments during the course of your probation, which can be up to 18 months. Do you have any questions about your possible sentence in this case? No, you know, Your Honor. All right. If at any time you do have questions, let me know. All right. Now I need to make sure that you understand the rights that you are giving up. As I indicated to you, I will accept your plea based on a proffer of evidence, but you have a constitutional right to a trial by jury to go to trial and have 12 individuals who aren't attorneys or judges or lawyers necessarily who are independent uh, of the case listen to the evidence and make a determination as to the strength of the evidence. They uh, are sworn to be fair and impartial and to follow the law. Some of the things that they would be directed under the law to do is give you the presumption of innocence. The burden of proof lies with the state, it never shifts to you. Because of that, you're not required to present any evidence nor can you be compelled to testify. That is a pre uh, protection afforded to you under the Fifth Amendment of the United States and the Kansas Constitution. You can call witnesses on your own behalf if you desire, but the fact that you may choose not to call witnesses or testify cannot be a consideration by the jury of any evidence or inference of guilt whatsoever. Um, additionally, the prosecution can't just proffer evidence. They have to bring in live witnesses, bring in the physical evidence. All of that's subject to examination by you, your attorney, and cross-examination by your attorney of any one testifying against you. That's what's called your Sixth Amendment right to con confrontation. At the end of the day, the only way that you could be convicted uh, with a, a burden of proof on the state and a standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt is if all 12 jurors agreed on the same verdict. In other words, the state would have to convince all 12 jurors uh, that you were guilty on each and every element of each and every offense beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, and they must be in agreement in order to return a guilty verdict. If you were found guilty, you would have a right to take what we call a direct appeal to the Court of Appeals in Topeka, Kansas. That panel of appellate judges would review the entire trial transcript, ensure that you received a fair trial, none of your constitutional rights were uh, violated, and um, that there was sufficient evidence to support the jury verdict. But you don't uh, preserve any legal issues or have another court review your case if you don't go to trial in the first place. So you have to go to trial to take a direct appeal. So when you waive your right to trial, you're waiving all of the rights that are afforded to you that I talked about, and you're also limiting your rights to appeal. The only thing that you can appeal is if I give you an illegal sentence or some kind of sentence outside of the sentencing guideline um, provisions. 
Do you have any questions about your rights? No, Your Honor. Do you wish to waive your right to trial at this time? Yes, Your Honor. Last but not least, I need to make sure that you're of sound mind and good judgment as you sit before me and that you're not under any kind of duress. I'm How child. old are you? I'm 24. What is your highest level of education? Some college. Okay. So you can certainly read and write at a high school level. Yeah. So any documents that you've received, any letters or correspondence, you've been able to read those on your own? Yes, ma'am. All right. If you had legal questions, things that were sort of above your um, knowledge level, if you ask your attorney to answer questions for you, could he do so at a level that you could understand? Yes, ma'am. All right. Are you presently under the influence of any drugs or alcohol? No, ma'am. Have you ever been declared mentally ill or mentally um, incompetent, disabled or incompetent to a degree that you were committed and could no longer make decisions for yourself? No, ma'am. Ever had a guardian or conservatorship set up for you as an adult to handle your affairs? No, ma'am. Ever had a traumatic brain injury? No, ma'am. All right. Are you taking any prescription medications? Um, just for anxiety and uh, a mood stabilizer. Okay. Have you, are you taking those as directed? Yes, ma'am. Do they cause you any uh, mental confusion? No, ma'am. All right. Does anyone threaten you in any way to uh, cause you to change your plea from not guilty to no contest? Is there anyone that's threatening that they're going to do something to you if you take this case to trial? No, ma'am. Is anyone promising to reward you or pay you off if you waive your right to trial and enter a plea today? No, ma'am. So this is of your own free will? Yes, Your Honor. Is there any third party? such as a child or a parent or a friend or a boyfriend, anyone else benefiting from this plea agreement besides yourself that I may not be aware of? No, ma'am. All right. Are you satisfied with the services of your attorney? Yes, ma'am. Do you need any additional time to visit with your attorney before I ask you how you plead? No, ma'am. All right. On the sole count of possession of methamphetamine, level five drug felony, how do you plead? No contest. All right, thank you. Ms. Gillette? On August 23rd of 22, at 14, 19 hours, we had Deputy, or Sergeant Mike Cordell was on Highway 400 within Greenwood County. While on patrol, he observed a vehicle that was heading towards him, um, turned around and was on the east side of the county um, that was moving about 83 miles per hour in a 65 mile per hour zone. So he locked onto the vehicle at an 82 mile per hour. He turned around to stop the vehicle and the vehicle did not stop going up to ranges between 80 to 105 miles an hour. Eventually, a, two highway patrol troopers in the Odisha Police Department engaged in the chase with the vehicle and it was stopped near Neodisha, Kansas. During the time that Sergeant Cordell was following the, the vehicle, the front female passenger being the defendant had climbed over the seat into the back seat. He had observed her doing so. The car had um, avoided several tire deflation devices in the meantime. After Pulling off on 150th Road, they pulled into what would be a field area and Deputy or Sergeant Cordell pushed the vehicle with his front um, car guard, front guard into the field further to keep it from taking off again. After removing the suspects from the vehicle, there was a bag in the front seat of the vehicle area that had the identification and information in a financial card related to this defendant. There was also aluminum foil and um, syringes loaded and used in the area as well as melted pen tubes um, 
and several other things with Ms. Green being identified by her Alaska driver's license. Um, the items that were tested on her side of the car tested positive for both fentanyl and methamphetamine. During booking uh, process, Ms. Green informed the detention officer that she does use fentanyl and that the drugs found in the vehicle were not methamphetamine, but rather fentanyl that she had used. Um, so uh, that's the basis for this stop, um, some of the items being ground powder in a vial, um, the pins, the glass smoking tubes, and the foil that all were used to ingest methamphetamine the crystalline substance. Okay. All right, Ms. Green, I find that you're alert and intelligent. You understand the nature and the consequence of entering this plea, and you understand the rights that you are giving up. I further find that there is a factual basis for the plea, and I do find you guilty of possession of a controlled substance to wit, methamphetamine, in violation of KSA 65 4107 etc. Actually, it's 6541.05 at set. All right, I'm going to order a PSI. I'm going to schedule your case for sentencing. I would like to do that on my next uh, half day, Greenwood Elk Day, which would be Wednesday, June 14th. It does take six to eight weeks um, to put together a PSI, which we have to have at least seven days prior to sentencing. Um, so that your attorney uh, can look at your criminal history score, make sure it's accurate, and file any appropriate motions. I uh, guess my half day is also, though, my duty day in Butler. So I have first appearances from 1.30 to um, 2.30 or 3. Could you do this at 3 o'clock? Mr. Ambrose on Wednesday, June 14th. Well, I was going to ask between two and four, so you got it right where I wanted it, Your Honor. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. All right, Ms. Green, I'm going to add a condition to your bond that you participate in an LSIR, which is a risk assessment, and that you participate uh, in a substance abuse valuation. These things are necessary to determine whether or not you qualify for Senate bill treatment. I'm going to tell you what I tell many folks is, as I indicated to you, Senate bill folks, Senate bill qualified people, individuals are guaranteed an opportunity for treatment. So, it behooves you during your evaluation to be honest about your usage, your history, your family background, those kinds of things. So don't um, downplay uh, your usage if, if you're an IV user or um, when you started using or how much you use because that could work against you when it comes to their evaluation um, because you have to score high on those two tests um, in order to qualify for Senate bill treatment. So I'm not asking you to, you know, um, be deceptive either way. I'm not asking you to, to lie to make, make yourself worse or to make yourself better. I'm just asking you to be very honest with the evaluators, okay? All righty. Anything and, further for today? Yes. Just briefly, Your Honor, um, as to bond, would I spoke with Miss Green about this earlier today? She has asked that the court would contemplate um, granting her an own recognizance bond with some additional conditions. First off, that she be only released upon us get providing proof that she has an Oxford house to go to. That looks like that would be in Wichita, is where it's probably going to be the closest option for us. 
Um, her mother has been making some calls regarding that. And then secondly, she's suggested uh, that if the court deems it appropriate for some adequate assurances that she be placed on an electronic monitor. But I understand we, Ms. Green and I both understand that she got herself here in a rather colorful way and it's been a bit of a process, um, but she is uh, asking for those special conditions to provide the court some assurances and so she's in a sober living environment. Okay, uh, well, Ms. Gillette mentioned something about an Alaska identification card. And then I show on this bench warrant that she was arrested in El Paso County, Colorado, which I think might be Colorado Springs. Um, uh, so where is she from exactly? She's from Alaska. However, she's been in the lower 48 for a little while, not terribly long. Um, the, she doesn't have any substantive connections here. However, um, there would be, you know, like we're asking for an Oxford house is the option here that we're asking for with full understanding that she's going to have to stay in Kansas for a while. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. Judge. I, uh, yes. Just, just so you're aware, this is the case where Miss Green had been in Alaska that had been coming through Kansas. They were in a Colorado car that had been bought the week before and not registered into her name. The guy said he had sold it to Miss Green. Uh, she took off on her bond and was in Colorado. And she was the one who was arrested during court because she was telling us she was in Alaska with her mom. And her mom paid a very substantial $7,500 cash bond for her. And she took off on it. Lied to judge to where she was at in court on Zoom court. And Mr. Cox had arranged for her to be arrested while she was on YouTube. And then she continued to not show up for court. She was given an extradition bond in the state of Colorado, failed to appear for her extradition hearings in Colorado. Then I had to obtain and start all the paperwork for a governor's warrant to bring her back to the state of Kansas. And so Miss Green ended up going through a very lengthy process for us to get her back to the state of Kansas because she intentionally lied to a judge during court proceedings about where she was. And she is sitting in the Greenwood County Jail where she's at today because she lied to court, failed to appear for her extradition warrant in Colorado, and I had to obtain the governor's warrant. So we had asked that her bond remain where it's set. All right, well, it's currently set at 15,000 cash or surety. Um, I had thought about reducing it to 10,000 cash or surety, which is still a decent bond, but given the history, I don't think I'm going to modify it at all. However, additionally, what I was going to say, Mr. Ambrose is, once they've done, probation's done, an LSIR and a substance abuse evaluation, and it looks like she's presumptive probation, and if there's an opening at a treatment facility or an Oxford house or something along the lines of, of what would be uh, consistent with Senate bill treatment, you can file a motion. I'll, I'll get a hearing quick and consider modifying her bond at that point. Sounds terrific, Judge. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. If there's nothing further, we are adjourned. Uh, judge, in the jail, we have uh, her bonds at 100000 100000 Okay. Well, the, only, the no last notes I have, 913.23. 15,000 cash or surety. So I don't know what happened after that. It's $100,000 from March 3rd of 23 was when it was set at $100,000 with EMD required if she bonds out so that we would know where she was and if she cut her bracelet off, we would be- Well, I also have a bench warrant in front of me um, that for the bond forfeiture bench warrant signed by Judge Webster um and returned on january 18th at fifteen thousand cash or surety 
So are you saying that when she was picked up in January, then she went back in front of Judge Webster, who had originally issued a $15,000 bond, and then Judge Webster raised it to $100,000? She did with the EMD required, and Judge Lee heard it again on March um, 3rd, and he said the bond should remain at $100,000 cash surety with EMD. Who did? Who did? Webster. Webster said it at a hundred thousand, and then Judge Lee reviewed it in March for oh. he filled in for she was sick. Okay. Um, and fact, it the same. He heard the bond motion before. Okay. Well, I'm not sure it matters whether it's fifteen, fifty, a hundred. I'm not sure that she's going to be able to make it. My view, for whatever it's worth, is probably fifty thousand would be a solid enough bond, but. The point is, I'm not going to modify whatever her bond is currently set at until we get the necessary um, evaluations done to see where she falls for um, under the sentencing guidelines and with regard to Senate bill treatment, and we can get something lined up. One of the uh, problems, as you all know, Mr. Ambrose, is that folks who are not residents of Kansas get disqualified for Senate bill treatment. So it might behoove us to have her at a residence at an Oxford house at some point um, ready for sentencing so that she can, you know, stay in Kansas and do her Senate bill treatment. Understood, Your Honor. Um, That'll be something we'll address it once we get the